How's it going, Bone Builders? It's me, the Articulate Reptile, here to show you how to make your own Bouchen style exploded snake skull. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you some tips and tricks to make this anatomical amazement. So stay tuned. But first, we gotta learn something. So put on those thinking caps and let's go. So it's Paris in the early 19th century, and Napoleon I, also known as Napoleon Bonaparte, established the University of France, which was technically not a university, but a state organization that had authority over pretty much all of the educational establishments in France. One of these establishments was Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris, which was resided over for a time by a chief physician and anatomist named... Mm, okay, here we go. Edme Francois Cheva Bouchain. I, uh, can't find a picture of the guy, so just keep looking at this French bulldog. Sorry. So Bouchain recognized that the complexity of the human skull was not well illustrated. You see, the skull is actually made up of 22 bones, 8 cranial bones that comprise the brain case, and 14 facial bones that make up the face. So he invented the first known exploded skull, showing the bones of the cranium separated by metal plates, rods, and screws with sections even drilled out to also show the roots of the teeth and the paths of vessels and nerves throughout the bones. Hence, the technique of disarticulating a human skull in this fashion bears the name Bouchen. The snake skull, not unlike a human skull, can be broken down into at least two dozen individual pieces. One of the most distinct features of the snake skull is its dynamism or its ability to flex under mechanical stress. We already know that a snake's jaw is highly flexible to accommodate swallowing of prey larger than its head, but those properties extend, albeit to a lesser degree, to the other bones in the skull with the exception of the brain case, which is rigid to, you know, protect the brain. The flexibility is due to strong ligaments connecting these bones, and said ligaments actually make the process of separating these bones easier. Now I'm going to assume that you already have yourself a snake skull. The skull needs to be whitened and degreased at this point. And from there it's fairly simple to start the process of separating the bones. Just place the skull and its pieces into a cup of warm water. Warm and hot water works better than cold and will soften the ligaments between the bones faster. Just change the water when you need to. Now this can take up to 12 hours, so be patient and let's talk about the tools that you're going to need. One of the main components of the assembly is wire. There are different gauges of wire, different materials. It depends on the size of the skull and the weight of the pieces, the individual and size of the individual pieces that you are going to be uh, separating. Generally, any wire processing, bending, and cutting tools are extremely helpful. A drill can come in especially handy if you have to drill small holes in which to put the wires. Although some skulls are too small to actually do this. I like this stylus with the Dremel, and I do have very small drill bits that I can use to drill these small holes. If the bones are large enough, you can use small brass plates. But be mindful if you do this, you're going to need micro screwdrivers, micro screws, and you will definitely need the drill that I mentioned previously to drill the holes for the screws. I use a few different types of super glue, thin, medium thickness, and a gel type. Also, you might want to grab yourself some baking soda, just regular household baking soda. Fine grit sandpaper will also come in handy. Small paint brushes, fine forceps, no teeth. Small the bones and small the forceps. Dissectors and elevators are good for just general use. Q-tips to absorb super glue. You can also use paper towels. And these strange little devices also known as soldering or jewelry clips that will help you hold pieces still while you are working. A couple of things to consider before we start. I'm going to refer to the bones of the skull as I work, but I'm not going to go over the anatomy in any detail. Although the bones in many snake species are the same in name, there will be variations among species in the size, shape, and position of these bones. And finally, 
The advice I'm giving should be thought of as what really works well for me, and as long as you're safe in your technique, I encourage you to experiment with what works best for your particular style of building. Alright, so my snake skull has been soaking for probably about 16 hours now. So I'm going to grab a couple of pieces that have uh, fallen apart on their own, and these are actually the pieces of the lower jaw. And I'm going to show you how easy they are to separate if they've been soaking long enough. This is the quadrate bone attached to the articular. Now, all I'm really going to do is just kind of give it a little bit of a wiggle, and I can feel that play in that ligament back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until the stress helps me remove the piece. Don't be afraid to use a small blade. I'm using a leaven blade in this instance to cut that ligament between the bones. Just be very careful not to cut the bones themselves. Remember, gentle pressure because we don't want to break the bones when we separate them. A back and forth motion and patience will separate them. Now I'm going to place these pieces in a layout that reflects the anatomical layout that I want to do for the Bouchain skull. This will make it easier as I move through the pieces to construct an order to the bones that I have already separated. As with the last jaw piece, I'm going to take the quadrate, rock it back and forth, separate the ligaments, separate it easily. A small cut on the dentary articular, a wiggle, a separate, and again, lay the bones out as they will be put together in my finished product. I'm going to continue on by grabbing some more chunks that have fallen off. So this is the palatine pterygoidal uh, complex. It's made up of three bones and uh, they separate fairly easily. First, I can wiggle the palatine, separate that. Then the transpalatine. Do the same exact thing for the other side. Although in this case, I have to retrieve the transpalatine as it had already fallen off the complex. So I move on to the maxillary bones, which again have already separated from the skull as a whole. Always check the orientation before you lay them out. I will continue with the vomer and the premaxillary bones, which make up the nose of the snake. The skull still has the supertemporal bones attached to it, so I will cut it with a knife and again gently wiggle it off. Always be very cautious when removing the small bones like the superorbital around the actual eye socket. They are very small and delicate. Sometimes you can just leave them on if you do not want to break down the skull to that level. If anything is stuck, just make sure that you're patient and soak the skull if you need to. In this example, I'm going to leave the postfrontal and frontal bones on as they are pretty difficult to remove in a small snake skull like this. So I finished breaking down my skull as far as I want to for this particular project. And again, everything is laid out in an anatomical fashion that will help me during my assembly. Now I'm going to let the bones dry and then move on to the next step, which is cleaning and finishing the bones. I'm going to use my Dremel stylus with a stainless steel wire wheel on it. Now I have this drill hooked up to a control that allows me to use my foot to turn it on and off, which is incredibly convenient. I recommend having a setup like this if you really want to do fine precision work, drilling, buffing, and cleaning of the bones. If using a drill or a wire wheel to remove ligament and periosteum, do small passes. Be very gentle and take your time. You only want to remove the ligament and the bone underneath can be abraded away if the pressure is too high. Specifically to a stainless steel wire wheel, you do not want to use excessive pressure because it will impart stainless steel powder onto the bone, which will become very difficult to get out. I would also recommend a nice selection of cutting and diamond burrs. Here I'm using a diamond burr because they're a little bit more forgiving and will remove smaller increments of ligament and periosteum, which is extremely useful for very small bones. So while I was cleaning a couple of these components, I noticed there was a lot of damage and missing teeth. 
I'm going to get creative here, and I'm going to do a split skull bouchin, which I have never tried before. So I've cut the brain case in half with a cutting wheel, and I'm going to assemble the parts around one side, possibly some on the other side. While doing these types of contrasts, you have to remain open-minded and creative, because sometimes you just have to deal with the loss and damage of the components you're working with. So now I've cleaned all my parts, and now I'm going to start the wiring process. I've got some nice 24 gauge wire here, and some 22 gauge wire. I think I'm going to go for the 24 because this skull is pretty small. Grab my tools for cutting and bending my wire, and then we'll move on to the assembly. Before I even start attaching bones and wires together, I'm going to go over a couple of tips and tricks for working with small pieces of wire. One of the biggest problems I run into is that the wire becomes bent, and then once it's on the snake, once it's actually positioned, it's kind of difficult to move it without putting the whole construct under stress. So I'm going to cut a small piece of wire and introduce some damage into it so that I can show you a good way in straightening it. So what you're going to need is you're going to need two objects with very smooth surfaces that can be rubbed together. I'm going to use these little wooden slugs from another craft project. The length of wire I intentionally damaged earlier can just be placed on one of the flat surfaces. Simply place the other flat surface over the wire, sandwiching it together, and roll it perpendicular to the angle of the wire that has the damage. I'll roll this for a few seconds at a time before checking the wire. As you can see, it's been straightened nicely. Another tip I can give you is to use a very fine grit sandpaper to polish the ends of the wires, thereby increasing the surface area and allowing the superglue to stick much better. I'm going to begin by putting together the lower jaw. I'm going to insert a wire into the natural channel inside the articular. I'm going to add a drop of medium thickness superglue in this instance. And now here comes the job for the baking soda I mentioned earlier. If you put regular household baking soda on any cyanoacrylate based superglue, it will catalyze almost immediately, releasing a lot of heat. Now while this is incredibly useful for putting small parts together, it must be done in small increments. The reason this incremental buildup is so important is that large globs of superglue will only catalyze on the surface and will become kind of a gummy mess that don't really support anything. After several seconds, I'll remove the excess baking soda with a small paintbrush. I will repeat this process for the dentary portion of the lower jaw, inserting the wire, adding glue, and then baking soda. It must be noted that while you can build up and attach things with this super glue baking soda trick, if you want to sand or drill this plaque formed by the super glue, please wear a respirator because the particles in the air will contain super glue. As always, be safe. I'm going to begin work on the brain case, so I enlist the help of my little soldering clip to hold it in place while I drill and add the wires and glue to it. Again, never hurts to check the orientation. I will begin this portion by securing the stapes with a very thin, very fast setting super glue. You can use paper towel pieces and q-tips to dab off the excess, but do it quickly as it will set very fast. I'll begin with the super temporal. Now these bones are too small and too thin to drill an adequate hole in them. I can drill a small channel, but the super temporal is very, very thin, so I'm not going to risk it. I'll simply lay the wire on top of it, on the underside, so it can't be seen well. I will then add some super glue and then catalyze it with baking soda until I'm happy that it's secured. After brushing off the excess baking soda, I'm going to use a very small cutting burr to drill a very tiny hole in the top of the brain case. Now I'm going to introduce a wire with a small right angle curve on the end that will help the piece set in place while I secure it with super glue and baking soda. Next I'm going to attach the quadrate. This is also a very thin delicate bone, but it's substantially larger than super temporal. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a very shallow channel in it and lay the wire inside that channel to give it better purchase. I'll then super glue it 
baking soda, dust it off, and repeat the process if I need to secure it anymore. I brought in a second helping hand and turned the clip with the uh, skull on it upside down. Then it's as easy as one, two, and three. So in this video, the last piece I'm going to attach is the pre-constructed jaw from the first part. I'm going to run a wire up the articular and then attach it to the quadrate using the same techniques you've seen in this video so far. I don't want to go over the entire construction and I'll show a photo of it at the end. But I hope these tips and tricks and this general information I've given you on how to create this really cool piece has helped you in some way. Check out the links in the description below to anatomical drawings and references that might help you build this piece. Leave me some comments and some questions below, as well as ideas for future videos. Check out some of my other work on Facebook and Instagram at The Articulate Reptile. Again, thanks a lot for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.